Hi, my name is Jasana Rodriguez Lopez, and I'm going to be talking to you today about updates in CTEF, medical management, and choice of anticoagulation. These are my disclosures. So I thought I'd start with a case, and this is a 31 year old who was recently started on oral contraceptives and presented with three weeks of shortness of breath and was found to be hypoxic. A CT was done which showed extensive proximal thrombus and DVT and she was started on a Pixaban. And an echo at that time showed RV dysfunction and an RVSP of 85. After three months, she came to the pulmonary embolism follow-up clinic and was still complaining of some shortness of breath and had pulmonary hypertension by echo. And we did a ventilation perfusion scan, which you can see here at the bottom right, which was still abnormal, consistent with chronic clots. And so we did a CTEF evaluation. A right heart cath MPAgram confirmed that she had surgical CTEF, and so she underwent pulmonary thromboendarterectomy successfully. So first question is, what anticoagulation should she go on when she leaves the hospital? Should she go back on the direct oral anticoagulant or DOAC? Should we do a heparin or low molecular weight heparin bridge to warfarin or low molecular weight heparin indefinitely? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about anticoagulation in CTEF. Um, anticoagulation is recommended for life in patients with CTEF in order to prevent recurrence. And so in our center, and I think in a lot of centers, most patients after surgery are discharged on warfarin. The pros of that is that we have extensive experience um, and we know that people on warfarin have a very low risk of recurrent PE or VTE um, who have CTEF. The cons of using something like warfarin is that it has a narrow therapeutic window there's a lot of food and drug interactions, and there's a, a need for um, frequent blood draws, with, with, which patients really don't like. So many centers are now using DOAX either at discharge or soon after discharge. Um, our center um, has started doing um, warfarin for a couple of months after surgery and then possibly transitioning to a DOAC. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that it's really important not to use a DOAC in someone who has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And what do we know about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in CTEF? Um, we know that it is a risk factor for development of CTEF. And you can see here when looking at different risk factors, there's an odds ratio of over three for development of CTEF in patients with um, anti antiphospholipid antibody or lupus anticoagulant. Um, we also know that if you compare patients with um, pulmonary arterial hypertension to patients with CTEF, those with CTEF have a much higher um, prevalence of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So it is, it's something that you will see in a CTEF patient population. And so this has been looked at in this patient population using DOAX in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And here are two of the biggest studies that have looked at this. Um, here on the left, this was a, um, a, a study of very high risk patients. They were triple positive. So they had um, a positive anticardiolipin, a positive lupus anticoagulant, and positive beta-2 um, glycoproteins. And they randomized the patients to warfarin uh, versus rivaroxaban. And you can see here, um, here's the cumulative incidence of events. And um, this was a composite endpoint of death, thromboembolic events, and major bleeding. And um, there was a much higher incidence of events in the rivaroxaban group, which was this um, dotted line, compared to the warfarin group, which is the red solid line. Um, there was another even larger study looking at um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome patients that were also um, randomized to warfarin versus rivaroxaban. And rivaroxaban did not show non-inferiority to the warfarin in this, in this patient population. There was a non-statistically significant near doubling of the risk of recurrent thrombosis. And interestingly, um, most events in the warfarin group happened when the INR was subtherapeutic, but there was definitely a difference between the two groups 
um, and the River Aksaban group performed um, less well than the Warfarin group. Um, most of these recurrent events, however, were arterial thrombotic events like stroke and MI um, rather than venous thromboembolic events. So do we know anything about using DOAX in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? Um, this is probably the only trial that has looked at this, and it was a retrospective study uh, from a... Um, a large center in England that looked at 794 patients treated with warfarin compared to 206 treated with DOAX who had had pulmonary endarterectomy for CTEF. And what they found is that there was no difference in major bleeding um, when comparing the two groups, no difference in hemodynamics or functional status, no difference in survival, but the um, recurrent VTE rate was higher in the DOAC group compared to the warfarin group. And so, you know, this is a retrospective study, and so we don't really, there may be some biases of why some patients were put on warfarin versus a DOAC. So we can't make f any final conclusions based on this study, but it's interesting that these uh, findings were seen and um, it deserves further um, studying to see if DOACs are indeed safe or not in patients with CTEF undergoing endarterectomy. Now let's talk a little bit about CTEF treatment algorithm. Um, and I'm gonna focus mostly on medical therapy for CTEF. So anybody who gets a CTEF diagnosis is recommended to continue lifelong anticoagulation. Um, they should be uh, evaluated by an expert CTEF team, which is usually a multidisciplinary team involving um, pulmonary hypertension experts, surgeons, interventional cardiologists or radiologists, and so that group determines whether a patient has operable versus non-operable disease. In operable disease, the treatment of choice is pulmonary endarterectomy. In non-operable disease or patients who develop persistent or recurrent symptomatic pulmonary hypertension, target a medical therapy with or without balloon pulmonary angioplasty or BPA is recommended. So what is the medical therapy? A few drugs have been studied uh, as medical therapy in CTEF patients, and this is just a few of them. The benefit trial looked at um, Bosentan um, in inoperable or recurrent uh, pulmonary hypertension and found that there was no difference in the six-minute walk test, which was the, one of the primary endpoints, although there was an improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance. There was a small sildenafil study that also showed similar findings, but was only 19 patients. Um, and then I'll focus more on the CHEST-1 trial, which was um, a study looking at Rio Siguat um, in inoperable or recurrent pH in CTEF patients. And the CHEST-2 trial was um, the long-term open-label extension, which actually showed that the improvements in six-minute walk distance lasted long-term. So let's focus a little bit on the CHEST-1 trial. So this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and the study population, again, were inoperable CTEF or persistent recurrent pH after endarterectomy. They had to have an abnormal PVR and a pulmonary, mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25 with a six-minute walk distance between 150 and 450 meters. And the primary endpoint was six-minute walk distance. And you can see here the red line is the Rio Siguat group, versus the gray line, which is the placebo group, and there was a very significant difference in six-minute walk distance. And not only was there a difference, it looked like the treatment group had um, persistent improvements in walk distance over time, whereas the placebo group um, actually declined. They also had some secondary endpoints, which um, also showed uh, improvements in the Rio Seguad group versus placebo. There was an improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, an improvement in nt -pro bmp and an improvement in WHO functional class, and all of them were statistically significant. Um, this also was an interesting study looking at the CHEST-1 uh, 
patient population and using the um, risk criteria that were developed by the French uh, registry group. They have four low risk criteria, which included a cardiac index greater than 2.2, a right atrial pressure less than eight, and a six minute walk distance greater than 440 meters with New York Heart Association functional class one to two. And the more low risk criteria you meet, the better you do and the lower your mortality. And so when looking at the two groups from the CHESS-1 uh, study, those who received Rio Sigwat, initially most of the patients were in the intermediate to high risk group and at follow up, a lot of the patients were now in the low to intermediate risk group versus the placebo group that basically didn't really have a change in, in risk classification. Most of the patients still stayed in the moderate to high risk group. So a few words on Rio Sigwat. It's, it's a drug that needs to be titrated. Its major side effect is hypotension, so you have to monitor blood pressures when giving this medication. It's titrated by 0.5 milligrams three times daily at intervals of about two weeks or more to the highest tolerated dose, and the max dose is two and a half milligrams three times a day. And it should not be used with nitrates or PDE5 inhibitors because it can cause excessive hypotension. Now, I also wanted to talk about the MERIT-1 trial which was uh, published in 2017, and it looked at using macetentan in 80 patients with CTEF adjudicated as inoperable. And this was a smaller trial. It was a phase two double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, of patients who were functional class two to four with a PVR of at least 400 and a walk distance between 150 and 450. And in this study, the primary outcome was change in pulmonary vascular resistance which you can see uh, was um, a bigger change in the treatment group versus placebo. So it, it did reach their primary endpoint. And their secondary endpoint was change in six minute walk. You can see here the mesotentin group in orange definitely had an improvement in six minute walk compared to the placebo group, which did not have an improvement. So let's go back to our case. So I saw the patient on six month follow up and she still had some symptoms of shortness of breath and had some um, RV dilation by echo. Felt a lot better than before surgery, but still not back to fully back to baseline. So we repeated a right heart cast and there, were there was significant improvement in her pulmonary hemodynamics, but she still had some residual pulmonary hypertension. You can see her numbers here. The mean PA pressure was 27 with a wedge of 10 cardiac output of four and a PVR of 4.2. So the question is, what do we do next? Do we just continue to monitor? Do we start medical therapy with Rio Sigwat? Do we refer her for a balloon pulmonary angioplasty or do we do Rio Sigwat plus balloon pulmonary angioplasty? And I think the answer to this question is there's no really right answer. I mean, clearly she still has some pulmonary vascular disease. And so in her, we actually started medical therapy with Rio Sigwat. Um, in patients like this, I think it's worth re-evaluating with a pulmonary angiogram to see if there are any um, lesions that can be targeted with balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And so depending on the patient, you may do medical therapy alone, BPA alone, or medical therapy plus BPA. There is one study that um, hasn't been published yet, but the results were discussed at one of the meetings, the RACE study, which looked at inoperable CTEF patients, so a little bit different than our patient in this case because she had had surgery and had recurrent uh, pulmonary hypertension or residual pulmonary hypertension. These were inoperable patients, and they were randomized into a Rio Sigwad versus balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And the primary endpoint was pulmonary vascular resistance at 26 weeks, and they found that the BPA group had a much higher, uh, much better improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance, 60% decrease, compared to only a 32% decrease in the Rio Sigwat group. And this difference was statistically significant. That being said, both groups had a significant decrease in PVR. Um, the other secondary endpoints in the study were six minute walk distance, which did not find a statistically significant difference but the patients in the BPA group did have um, a more improvement in functional class than those in the Rio Sigwat group. So I think we still need to 
know a little bit more about this and and study this uh, better, but um, I think medical therapy has a big role in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, especially in patients who are inoperable or who have recurrent pulmonary hypertension after surgery. Thank you very much.